Um, thank you very much for that introduction and for um, organizing this event and um, all the events you guys do. Um, this is an issue that close to my heart and I think a lot of folks around the table. Um, very briefly, who, uh, how many congressional staff do we have here? Okay, great, good, good. Um, so I'll be looking forward to hearing your thoughts um, and questions at the end of this um, discussion. Um, I run the Congressional Oversight uh, Initiative at the Project and Government Oversight. We'll talk a little bit more about um, what we do and how we tackle some of the issues that I think are going to come up in this um, seminar. Um, I know that Kevin asked us to start with the definition of oversight. I work with a very, very broad definition of oversight, um, being just about any action that Congress takes to contain information relevant to enacted laws, laws under consideration, or areas of potential legislation. Um, and when you look at some of the authorities that, um, that Congress has, uh, about as broad and as vague as general um, as that. Um, the title of this event um, has to do with the capacity of Congress to conduct oversight. Um, I want to break that down into some separate parts. Uh, I think more also um, works with these same kind of um, categories. Um, capacity, very strictly, is a measure of resources against workload. Um, but also capability, the ability of staff um, to, to have the knowledge, talent, and expertise to work with, um, with that capacity. Authority, which I like to talk about both in terms of your statutory authority or um, your absolute authority, um, constitutional authority to conduct the oversight, as well as your practical authority, which I would compare to um, your dog should listen to you, um, but practically it does not listen to you. Um, We'll talk more about that in a bit. And then finally, the issue is will. Will leadership, will committee um, chair and ranking um, to, uh, to address the, um, the issues of being able to conduct oversight and, and have the resources and staff, um, everything else that I just listed above, um, to push forward. <clears throat> There's a general consensus for the folks that, um, um, that we work with here in front of the table and around the table um, that the glory days of congressional oversight um, are in our rearview mirror. Um, I don't. Um, I don't necessarily share some of that pessimism. Uh, it seems like we may be entering a um, a renaissance uh, of congressional oversight. There's a really aggressive like ambivalence. I can't really put my finger on it, but everyone seems to be investigating all of a sudden. And yet, I don't know if the, 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 the tires are really catching traction. Um, but it's exciting to see. Um, and I have to say, I prepared most of my thoughts on this before. A lot of we started seeing some positive signs from some of the higher profile um, investigations. So um, um, uh, this is a little bit, uh, I feel like I'm giving a talk about the Titanic and the lack of icebergs um, just before everything hit, or just after everything hit, I guess. Um, in any case, I'm going to back up and start with capacity real briefly. Like I said, I consider a measure of resources against workload um, and answering the question whether Congress has the money and the staff to adequately oversee, uh, and specifically, in, um, for my interest, the executive branch. Um, but um, issues of, of, of relevant oversight generally. Um, and I would go back to um, some of the great work uh, the Archon Institute published um, and some of their partners um, pointing out uh, that we have uh, effectively one of the largest governments in world history overseen by one of the smallest congressional <coughs> staffs um, of the modern era. Uh, and that to me is stunning uh, looking at my experience on Capitol Hill um, over the past several years um, and knowing what the staffing levels were and how hard staff worked um, to try to do this work um, and then uh, to look back and see uh, the kind of staffing that was available 30 or 40 years ago, the budgets that were available, and then now when people are writing stories coming out of the Trump-Russia investigations and talking about the staff of the Watergate Committee and around Contra and how you had 140 staffers working on our investigation, which um, kind of boggles my capacity to, um, to comprehend those sorts of resources getting thrown onto a, an oversight investigative project. Um, just to go over that in a little bit of detail, in 1983, the federal budget was around $800 billion. Um, by 2015, it had uh, quadrupled to $3.7 trillion. Uh, meanwhile, the House um, reduced their overall staffing by three positions. I think it was, I think it was right. Um, and that's concerning only because you have a lot more going on that needs eyes kept on it, um, but also because a lot of the, the a lot of the issues and programs and things that 
which the receipts have gotten more complicated, a lot more complex in the last 30 or 40 years. Um, when you're looking at the kind of IT systems and satellites, when you're seeing uh, industry, entire industries emerging almost overnight, um, uh, it, it strains credulity that you could have the same or smaller levels of staffing um, and resources put against those issues so that Congress, that Congress can oversee and legislate responsibly. Um, and then a lot of the issues that Congress is, uh, that has always overseen, um, issues regarding the economy, foreign relations, um, all of these things are operating with greater complexity, I think, um, than before. Uh, and it's troublesome that we don't, um, I think, have the staff and resources in place uh, to provide the, the, uh, the amount of coverage that's necessary. Um, the second issue of authority, uh, and I want to talk not so much about the constitutional statutory power to conduct oversight, but the practical authority of being uh, respected, being listened to, and getting your, your calls returned and your, your questions answered. Um, one of the things that, um, that, that I and my colleagues saw while we were on the Hill, and I've only seen more of now that I have a, a really wonderful perspective working with, um, with Democrat and Republican staff from the House and Senate on a variety of um, oversight um, committees, uh, as well as personal offices, um, <coughs> excuse me, is that uh, staff are under so much pressure to produce and respond to whatever the issues of the day are that a lot of the oversight work that's going to take days and weeks and months to follow through possibly on a single request simply gets dropped. Um, I have, a, this is an apocryphal story, but that makes it no less true in my heart, um, that uh, there was a uh, congressional liaison from one of the agencies um, who had a three call rule that um, after the first request, they needed to get three calls from the staffer before they actually looked into, into producing the information. Because 90% of the time, they could cut their workload because they never, nobody ever followed up. Um, and uh, at least from my experience on the other side of the telephone, that seemed to hold true, um, uh, more or less uh, throughout the executive branch, uh, with a few exceptions. Um, but I think it's because a lot of folks don't follow up. Um, and, I don't, and I really don't fault congressional staff for, not, for failing to have the capacity to do that. Um, for the issues that we were talking about um, before. The other thing is, is that members uh, have short attention spans and the issues that they're facing seem to be propping up faster and faster, especially these days. And so an issue that was super important and was coming out of a constituent inquiry three or four months ago suddenly is going to get replaced by a bigger issue. When you have a, a limited staff and limited resources, you've got to throw them against the thing that seems like it's burning the hottest and the fastest at that moment. Um, I'll talk now about capability, um, which is both the, the tools available, um, the information resources, I should say, um, and I think that it's a, it's a, a cornucopia um, of opportunities and information from the Library of Congress, which is one of the great institutions the world's ever seen, and CRS, um, and the wonderful and local work that they can do, as well as uh, information gathering at GAO, um, houses and libraries, historians, that um, uh, I have, coming from the private sector, coming from reporting, the ability to pick up a phone and get answers from all of these folks um, right away, really amazing insights was, was um, such a luxury um, to be able to fill out context um, and understanding of any oversight issue, especially because um, from a reporter's desk, you might get thrown on a story on something that you know nothing about, some area of the economy or an industry, um, and you have nowhere to turn but the internet and your phone and hopefully people will get back to you by deadline. Um, whereas the ability to call up CRS or GAO and have somebody who's actually been studying this agency for a decade or two decades, who's happy to show up at a moment's notice or send you over all the relevant reports that are going to help get you up to speed, um, is really, really amazing. And, and it, it helps mitigate some of the worst damages of the lack of capacity, um, but it's not sufficient. Um, and I think that it gets um, over relied on um, GAO is uh, frequently um, concerned with the level of uh, requests that are coming in. CRS, I know also um, that uh, they're, they're essentially being asked to backfill um, on the lack of information and expertise um, in the congressional offices um, and it's putting a huge strain on these resources. And I should add also the ability to pick up the phone and call almost anybody in the world and they will give you information unless they happen to be a subject of your investigation. Um, <laughs> It's, it's really cool, um, just from anybody who wakes up in the morning with questions in your head, I think it's, it's, it's great. Um, 
there is an issue when you talk about capability with talent, experience, and training. Um, uh, there have been you know, plenty of research and things showing that you know your 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 average age um, of staffers is decreasing, and there are very very bright younger people um, with a great beard now. I can say that sort of thing. Um, uh, but the tenure also on Capitol Hill, those uh, the, the number of years people will stay before they leave for the private sector or something in an agency um, is getting shorter and shorter. So you're losing a lot of that institutional knowledge, and that's part of why we started working on the Congressional Oversight Initiative to try to capture some of that um, experience and knowledge, um, so it doesn't disappear forever and make it available both to best practices and ideas and knowledge of our resources, working with whistleblowers, etc. Um, and so. Generally speaking, the work that we try to do is gathering all of that talent and experience and then funneling it back and making it available to staffers who are coming through and may not have had the benefit of working with and at least being with 20 or 25 years of experience um, conducting investigations who will catch every error in a subpoena that you've drafted or, you know, or, or, um, or talk through the best way to question a witness. Um, so we try to make that expertise available to folks. Um, I am heartened. Uh, we do regular seminars. I'll talk a little bit about what we do at the end. I am heartened that folks um, show up at those, um, both people who are coming from um, authorizing committees and appropriating committees who, who do do oversight as part of their professional responsibilities, um, as well as folks who simply see it as an important part of their job, um, and they know that it's important to what they're doing, and they need to know how to get answers, and they're not getting the their questions answered. Um, so I'm heartened when I walk in and I see those full rooms of people who are, who are engaged in what we're trying to, to share with them and ask them questions. Um, I become disheartened when I hear some of the questions. Um, how do we use GAO? If I need a document and the agency won't give it to me, can I FOIA it? Um, what do I say when the agency won't give me information I requested until I tell them what I need it for? Um, these, are, these are simply questions that, that, that uh, someone on day one of joining a congressional office should explain what your authorities are, what your power is, um, and what you have a right to expect um, from agencies, or especially agencies you request information from. Um, so there's definitely work to be done, but the fact that they're showing up and asking those questions, I think, um, is, uh, is hugely promising. Um, and, uh, and of course, the resources of folks like Moore will be carrying the torch for oversight here for decades now and they'll be available, like this new book I was doing. I'm excited to, I just got my copy of that. Um, so the question of is there, does Congress have the capacity to do oversight? I think if you were to ask that of many staffers, the answer would simply be from their own vantage point, their own desk, no. Um, and uh, it's not their fault. We're thankful for them for highlighting that. Um, and uh, we're grateful that we're in a position to be able to, to help them um, and give them the tools they need. The last thing that I want to talk about is um, the issue of will, uh, which is uh, an, an ethical quality that lives in the heart of a lawmaker. Um, that is an awareness of the importance of the value of oversight, a desire to do that hard work, an understanding that it's sometimes thankless and that it's integral to the job of legislating. And I don't know how to light that fire in the hearts of our members. Um, I want to meet the person who does. Um, I imagine part of it is circumstantial and part of it is thinking political, um, but um, it's something that needs to happen um, because without it, we won't see the major changes in making resources available um, and increasing staffing and driving staff, driving, uh, staff to become trained um, and to retain that uh, knowledgeable staff so that oversight can happen. At the Congressional Oversight Initiative, we focus on the capability and authority questions on practical authority issues. We offer trainings and consultations. We publish a twice weekly newsletter. We host events for oversight investigation staff. Um, for the trainings, uh, we offer congressional staff free intensive two day boot camps on the basic components of oversight investigations. We do that jointly uh, with the Levin Center uh, and the Luger Center. Um, we also offer monthly Friday seminars on oversight investigations. We also do custom trainings um, to committees upon request. Um, and we try to drill on some of the basic skills, how to design an investigation, think through where your sources are going to be, working in a bipartisan manner, how to obtain information, legal arguments to rebut excuses from agencies and other subjects, how to write a credible report, how to plan for an effective hearing, how to follow up for maximum impact. But we also try to teach some best practices which collectively implemented 
that we think can help Congress improve its practical authority to conduct oversight. Things like making sure that all of your requests have deadlines, time deadlines, even the capital requests that you make over email to an agency official you may already know. Um, noting those deadlines in your calendar, however you keep a calendar, following up a week and a day before that deadline so that they don't show up at 5 o'clock on that day or 9 o'clock the next morning with some excuse for how this has to how this slipped through the cracks. Um, uh, I always like to stress um, the, um, the naked abuse of PowerPoint by agency officials. <laughs> Um, we had a habit of scheduling uh, default one-hour briefings um, with uh, agency representatives, and they would show up and say, we understand you have questions, but first we want to give you some background on the program, and then give a rather precisely time, 57-minute presentation, um, at which point you got three minutes to get your questions answered, very few of which were addressed by the PowerPoint, and then suddenly they need to go to their next appointment. Um, so for the briefings that I schedule, I made a very solid no PowerPoint rule. Um, and we would uh, discuss the questions, and if they felt like some of them were answered in the PowerPoint, we could work off of it as a resource, um, and they were willing to leave that material. But this was, this was my hour, this was my senator's hour, um, and the most important thing was what I learned when I was a reporter, which was going into any interview, which you might not even get an hour, you 10 minutes. You would say, what are the three things you need to walk away from this interview knowing? What are the three things you need to get a response on? Um, and so uh, acting like that and really putting priority on, on how your time is used, uh, we think is really important. Um, and collectively done, it helps, start, it helps start to retrain the agencies to respond in a more responsible way. <clears throat> um, and, uh, and so one of the things that we stress, both through these trainings as well as through our social get-togethers and whatnot, is that there is there's something of a, I don't want to say a fraternity, um, uh, or a sorority of oversight staff, but we are all in this kind of together. And when I fail to follow up on one of my requests, that person is going to be less likely to um, handle a subsequent request from another office um, uh, in the same way. And after they have 10 of those experiences, it's going to be worse for everyone. Um, so I want to uh, wrap up and use my last minute to its um, full impact. <laughs> I say, I love this work. I love the work that Congress does on oversight. I love the work working with the folks who do that oversight here in Congress. Um, there, there's a lot to be done in terms of building capacity, and I want to thank Kevin uh, and some of the great groups that he's worked with in, um, in advocating for improving Congress's um, ability to do oversight. Um, and if anybody has any questions, I'll look forward to taking them after our presentations. <coughs> Um, I want to thank you for inviting me. Uh, this is a, a, a big occasion for me because this is the first look I've got of this volume here. Uh, I have, uh, Justin and I uh, agreed, at least at the beginning, that uh, you know the, what we're covering here and the uh, uh, idea of what's the capacity of oversight uh, uh, is institutional authority, uh, resources, and will, and what you talked about. Uh, we depart a little bit from there because I see icebergs everywhere. And if people don't see these icebergs, you better clean your glasses and look. The latest iceberg is called a statement by President Donald Trump on signing H.R. 244 into law. This is his first and only signing statement, and it contained, it deals with the, you know, it came with the uh, uh, Consolidated Appropriations Act that they passed uh, a couple of weeks ago, and it's dated May 5th. In it, the President points out 76 provisions of that law that he's not going to follow. <laughs> and he, he describes them and his, uh, yeah, and, and his powers uh, as uh, uh, chief executive, uh, uh, commander in chief of, the, uh, of everything, uh, in the areas of intelligence, uh, in inspector general uh, access, that he'll decide <coughs> what information Congress will get. And those icebergs have been coming throughout the career, throughout my career when I started in 1973. But they are coming full blast 
in the last 10, 12 years. And that's what I want to talk about today. Um, the, in answer to the questions, as, as I said, I will assume that capacity encompasses those three uh, uh, topics. Uh, and my answer uh, is that uh, Congress, acting as a body through its committees, has the absolute constitutional power and responsibility to make and enforce information demands on the executive branch. It, all that it deems, it, for what it deems necessary to accomplish its legislative duties. That Congress, in, in, in also has established sufficient rules, uh, tools, and support mechanisms to identify, analyze, and effectively utilize sought after information. Though, as Justin points out, there is a, a, a rather large inadequacy of funding for legislative staff and the support agencies. And it's very questionable uh, that they can do the full nature of, of what is required. But what's really important is that for a decade, <coughs> there, has been a, there has been an uncontested executive strategy of forcing committees to enforce document and testimonial subpoenas by civil, lit civil litigation that has unmistakably demonstrated that it is crippling Congress's essential information gathering authority and thereby obstructing its core constitutionally mandated meaningful, to, uh, can, uh, meaningful legislative function. The uncertainty of whether committees can impose meaningful consequences for delays and outright refusals to comply with legitimate information demands has forced an environment of agency slow walking and encourage the, uh, the assertion of dilatory and non-constitutional privileges. The failure of Congress to challenge such blatant executive usurpations reflects an abnegation of institutional integrity and will. While Congress cannot expressly abdicate its core constitutional responsibilities by inaction and acquiescence, it can effectively be seated elsewhere, and that would be intolerable. Uh, in my 35 years as a legal analyst with CRS, which started in 1973, I particularly specialized in the issues related to congressional committee oversight and investigations. After many years, I apparently earned the reputation, uh, which you just heard, as a zealot with respect to Congress's prerogatives respecting investigative oversight. Following one of my uh, uh, periodic lectures on recent development, then recent developments in the area, one congressional participant left me a note commenting on my presentation. <coughs> it said, quote, Mort Rosenberg has never seen a valid claim of executive privilege. Go more. <laughs> <laughs> to this day, I haven't, I still haven't, and no court since the Supreme Court's ruling in the United States versus Nixon, which recognized but rejected a presidential claim of presidential privilege, has validated such a claim against the congressional information request in America's decision. In that period, I had hands-on investigative oversight experience as a legal counsel for a year, uh, to a special investigating committee, and I had two details totaling a year and a half at the House General Counsel's office. The rest of the time, I had the privilege of learning my trade by working with, mo with most of the great member oversiders of that era from both sides of the political aisle, which included John Moss, John, John Dingle, Ben Rosenfeld, Jack Brooks, Henry Waxman, Carl Lemon, and Char Chuck Grassley together with their extraordinarily talented, dedicated, and very long-serving staffers. If I had to boil down the essence of what I learned, it's this. First, the constitutional basis of Congress's 
virtually plenary oversight and investigatory powers is irrefutable. The courts have consistently recognized that in order to perform its core constitutional responsibilities, Congress can and must be able to acquire information from the President and the departments and agencies of the executive branch. The structure of checks and balances rests on the principle that Congress has the right to know everything, everything that the executive is doing, including all the policy choices and all the successes and all the failures in the implementation of those policies. The Supreme Court has made it clear that Article I presupposes Congress's meaningful access to information so that it can responsibly exercise its obligations to consider and make laws requiring or limiting ex uh, executive conduct, to fund programs supporting the executive policies of which it approves, to deny funds for those policies of which it disapproves, <coughs> and to pursue investigations of executive behaviors that raise concerns. Without timely knowledge of the policy choices and activities of the executive branch, which is often unavailable unless provided by the executive, Congress cannot perform those duties the framers envisioned. The, the words of the Supreme Court in its 1927 ruling in, in McGrain versus Daugherty, which is essential reading for anybody who's involved in this area, uh, is the keystone authority for the breadth and importance of for contemporary investigative oversight, and underlines the inextricable constitutional connection of an effective information process to the accomplishment of Congress's core legislative responsibilities. It's say, it's say, a legislative body cannot legislate wisely or effectively in the absence of information respecting the conditions which the legislation is intending to affect or change, or where the legislative body does not itself possess the requisite information, which not infrequently is true. Recourse must be made to others who may have it. Experience has taught that mere requests for such information are often unavailable, and also that information which is volunteered is not always accurate or complete. So some means of compulsion are essential to obtain what is needed. All this was true before and when the Constitution was framed and adopted. In that period, the power of inquiry with enforcing process was regarded and employed as a necessary and appropriate attribute to the power to legislate. Indeed, as an inherent in it. The second thing I learned was that committees wishing to engage in successful oversight must establish their credibility with the White House and the executive departments and agencies that they oversee early, often, and consistently, and in a manner evoking respect, if not fear. Standing and special committees have been vested with an array of formidable powers and rules to support their powers of inquiry which include the power to subpoena testimony and documents and to grant immunity to override a witness's claim of self-incrimination, which is relevant right now. The Supreme Court and appellate courts have also approved practices and processes that Congress has adopted for the conduct of oversight and hearings that do not accord witnesses the full panoply or procedural rights enjoyed by witnesses in adjudicatory proceedings. For example, there is no right of cross-examination of adverse witnesses or to discovery of material utilized by a committee as the basis of the question. Common law privileges, such as attorney-client or the deliberative process privileges, are available only at the discretion of the committees. And now, under new house rules promulgated for the 115th Congress, agency witnesses subpoenaed or staff depositions may not be accompanied by agency counsel, and agency representatives or members of the public are not allowed to attend the proceeding. The reason that was added is simple. Agencies were refusing, and have been refusing for the last couple of years, to allow uh, uh, either employees or officials to appear before the, uh, before the committees without having 
uh, an agency legal representative sitting by their side and effectively stifling the kind of testimony that comes. Those were the good, that's the good part, that they allowed them to come at least with a witness, with, a, with, a, with an attorney. For the most part, a lot of these agencies are now refusing to allow uh, uh, agencies, uh, you know, witnesses to come and are, as I said, slow walking information otherwise. To maintain the efficacy of these tools, it is absolutely critical to the success of an investigative power that there be a credible threat of a meaningful consequence for refusals to provide necessary information in a timely manner. Since 1975, that threat has been the possibility of a citation for criminal contempt of Congress or a trial before the bar of the House, either of which could result in imprisonment or a fine. There can be little doubt that such threats were effective in the past, at least until 2002. In particular, between 1975 and 1998, there were 10 votes to hold cabinet level officials in contempt of Congress, either at the subcommittee, committee, or full house levels. All of them, all of them, resulted in complete or substantial compliance with the information demands in question before the necessity of any criminal trial was uh, needed. It was my sense during that period that those instances established a credible threat that a condemn, contempt was possible, and that until 2002, even the threat of a subpoena was often sufficient uh, to move an agency to an accommodation with respect to document disclosures and testimony of agency officials, and for the White House to allow executive officials to testify without a subpoena. There was a period I worked a lot for John Dingle, during the time he was uh, chairman of the uh, uh, Oversight and Investigation Subcommittee of the Commerce Committee. He was so fearsome that if he issued what was called a dingle grant, which was a letter saying, we want the following information, agencies jumped at it because they knew that he would follow up. They knew that he had the capacity to be put somebody in an embarrassing position, both at a hearing and thereafter. Yeah. It all ended around 2002. And what has occurred in the last 15 years is that the Justice Department, with the support of the Office of Legal Counsel, <coughs> has developed a theory and a tactic to stop contempt citations. What they have, what they have uh, advised uh, all agencies and have followed up is that it is unconstitutional for a committee of Congress or for either house to hold an executive official in contempt of Congress, either through the criminal contempt procedure, uh, which is been used since, you know, effectively, you know, for uh, over a hundred years, or by an inherent contempt process, which has been used for almost 200 years, in order to protect the integrity of congressional actions. There have been two cases that have demonstrated the problem that's occurred. One started in 2006, dealing with uh, presidential firings of nine uh, United States attorneys, allegedly for uh, their lack of political uh, you know, a, a, you know, prosecutions uh, on behalf of the administration that was there at that time. All evidence led to the White House, to the White House Counsel's Office, to the uh, uh, Chief of Staff, to some advisors. Subpoenas were issued. The president claimed executive privilege that uh, he said, you know, that uh, would cloak these witnesses from even answering the subpoenas. 
Our House passed uh, a contempt citation against Harriet Myers at that time, who was, uh, who was the former uh, White House counsel, and against uh, the chief of staff, uh, the president's chief of staff. Before the subpoena, before the contempt citation was transmitted to, you know, when the, trans, when the contempt citation was transmitted, the attorney general said no. The president's claim of privilege, uh, uh, you know, the stops all that sort of action. It went to a district court, and the district court found that a. A house could order on its own authority its counsel uh, to contest and enforce a subpoena. Second, that the president had no a presidential claim of, of, of uh, immunity cannot protect against a congressional a valid con a congressional subpoena uh, for documents or testimony. That proceeding lasted about two years. There was a change of administration, and the uh, uh, the case was settled uh, rather unsatisfactorily. The decision was a terrific decision, the Myers decision. You all should read it uh, for its foundational, uh, you know, uh, force. The next case that came, and I'll stop. That is still going on. It started in 1910, uh, and it involved uh, the, the, the DEA, the, the uh, a drug smuggling, uh, a gun smuggling uh, operation uh, that sent guns to Mexico to be, uh, uh, you know, uh, followed in order to stop the, the, the trafficking you know, to uh, the cartels down there. There was an incident in which a DEA agent was shot to death with a gun that was you know, uh, transported. And a congressional committee started investigations as to how this tactic, you know, this kind of tactic was being done, why was it being done, on its face illegal. The Justice Department supported uh, the, uh, the action, saying that there was absolutely no truth that there was a gun running scheme being done by the, uh, by the government agency. And they persisted in that for nine months, even though the, the, the committee continued to investigate what was going on. Finally, 11 months after a, 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 a denial by the, F, by the uh, Justice Department that there ever had been such a scheme, they admitted that there was. And the next phase of the investigation was started. How is it that the uh, Justice Department made such an assertion, knowing that it was false, and why did it take so long to pull it? To make a very long story short, the, 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 the House Investigating Committee issued a subpoena for documents of how this was perpetrated by the Justice Department. They refused to uh, uh, hand over the documents. Once again, a case uh, a contempt of Congress was issued against the Attorney General Holder. He refused to, uh, you know, to obey the subpoena. A contempt citation was issued, and another case started. That case started five and a half years ago, so that a total of six and a half years have passed. A district court found that it was once again, appropriate for Congress to, to file such a suit, but said that the claim of deliberative process privilege, which is a common law claim, but which the Justice Department claimed had an aura 
of constitutional privilege in it was applicable and could be asserted by the Justice Department to stop it. It then refused to turn over 10,000 documents that had been uh, 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 identified as being subject to the subpoenas. The court opined that the deliberative process privilege was applicable and then said she looked at all the 10,000 documents to see whether they applied. <clears throat> a year and a half later, she reasserted her uh, deliberative process claim but decided not to deal with the normal process of balancing whether uh, the claim uh, you know, uh, uh, was applicable or whether it was vitiated by the fact that there was fraud involved in the case or mis you know, uh, uh, misactions uh, by, the, by the agency, saying that because the, in the Inspector General of the, uh, 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 of the Justice Department had also asked for but received all the documents that were in contest, that vitiated the case. It was an apparent attempt to moot the entire case. It's gone to an appeals court. A change of administration once again has stymied that. But what's happened by the recognition of an agency's ability to file a deliberative process uh, claim has been slow walking and claims of deliberative process as well as claims of other privileges, common law privileges, which, once again, Congress has historically maintained its discretion. What has to be done is a challenge to both of these uh, claims, that, the, the, that either the criminal contempt process or a revised uh, inherent contempt process shouldn't be rehabilitated in, and challenge these particular uh, uh, you know, uh, tactics of the Justice Department and of the executive. What's been happening is a full <coughs> address uh, uh, impingement on Congress's ability uh, to do effective oversight because it can't enforce its subpoenas. You can pour money into new staff, into new resources, but if, if there's recalcitrance in, 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 you know, in the executive, that forces and, it, and makes it impossible for timely, effective oversight, we're in real trouble. 